Hello friends, Jim here with Science Talk. I want to quickly discuss with you this abstract. It's from an article that uh, is published in January 2022 in the journal Marine and Petroleum Geology. In C2 temperatures and thermal properties of the East Siberian Arctic Shelf sediments, key input for understanding the dynamics of subsea permafrost. Now, there's 16 authors here. So you got Evgeny uh, Shuvlin, you got Boris Bukhanov, uh, I think it's Andrei Yurchenko. Show all 16 authors. Well, first of all, it's our old buddy Igor here, Igor Smilatov. Show all 16 authors. Let's do so. Okay. Dinara Devlashina, Natalia Shakova. Okay. And we have uh, Edward Spivak, uh, I think it's Vitaly Rusikov, Oleg Dudorov, if I'm remembering them, and then Nadezda uh, Kalstova. Uh, Kostova, Anna Tiknova, uh, and uh, I think it's Oleg Gust Gustafsson. But anyway, it's our old friends Igor and Natalia are co-authors on this. So, what are they reporting? Significant reserves of methane are held in the Arctic Shelf, but the release of methane to the overlying ocean and subsequently to the atmosphere has been believed to be restricted by impermeable subsea permafrost, which has sealed the upper sediment layers for thousands of years. Our studies demonstrate, key phrase here, progressive degradation of subsea permafrost, which controls the scales of methane release from the sediments into the water atmospheric system. It's breaking down. This cap is breaking down. Thus, new knowledge about the thermal state of subsea permafrost is crucial for better understanding of the permafrost hydrate system and associated methane release from the East Siberian Arctic Shelf, the ESAS, the broadest and shallowest shelf in the world ocean, which contains about 80% of subsea permafrost and giant pools of hydrates. Now, we're talking about the met these are basically methane water uh, conglom conglomerates that are frozen together. Meanwhile, the ESAS still presents large knowledge gaps in many aspects, especially with respect to subsea permafrost distribution and physical properties of bottom sediments. New field data show that the ESAS has an unfrozen, that is ice-free, upper sediment layer, which in C2 temperature is in the range of minus 1.0 to minus 1.8 C, and 0.60 C above the freezing point. That's referring to where sea ice can form. That is, you have to cool down. Uh, when you have oceanic water, it does not freeze at zero C. It freezes at temperatures below zero C in what's called freezing point depression. And basically that's where you get your brine rejection, so on. That's what we're referring to because you have, you know, you have salt water above it, you got a freezing point depression. On one hand, these cold temperature patterns may be related to the presence of subsea permafrost, which occur, which currently primarily occurs in the part of the ESAS that is shallower than 100 meters, while ice bearing sediments may also exist locally under deeper water in the Laptev Sea. I'll get back to that in a moment. On the other hand, the negative bottom sediment temperatures of minus 1.8 C measured on the Laptev C continental slope sediments underlying the water column as deep down as 330 meters may result from dissociation of gas hydrates or possibly from dense water 
cascading down from the shelf. Okay. In contrast, data collected on recent expedition in the northern Laptev shelf zones of warmer bottom temperatures are coinciding with methane seeps, likely induced by seismic and tectonic activity in the area. These warm temperatures are not seen in the East Siberian sea, uh, area, not even in areas of methane seeps, yet with little seismic activity. The thermal conductivity and heat capacity of bottom sediments recorded in a database of thermal parameters for the ESAS areas mainly depend on the lithification degree, basically referring to how dense or, or porous the substrate is, the moisture content and particle size distribution fine particles, larger particles, that sort of stuff. The thermal conductivity and heat capacity average about one uh, watt uh, per meter, and I guess uh, meter Kelvin, and about 2,900 kilojoules per cubic meter Kelvin, with plus or minus 20%, uh, plus or minus 10% variance, respectively, in all sampled Arctic sediments. Okay, I did a video some time ago, a little while ago, where I discussed what was happening with the methane at the Laptev shelf break. Now, the shelf break is where there is a transition from the shelf to the slope. Now, the shelf gets deeper and deeper as you move away from the shoreline, but it does so at a, a relatively shallow pitch. When you reach the shelf break, that's where it transitions from the shelf to the slope, and the slope then descends to depth at a much greater rate. Well, at that shelf break in the lab tab C, they're finding huge, basically, explosions of methane. That the, this ice cap that they refer to is being melted away from the introduction of warm Pacific water. Sometimes, depending where it is, sometimes from the Atlantic side as well. Now, they're talking about uh, tectonic uh, activity and so on, but there is also, uh, you know, the warmer oceanic water moving in that is melting the ice and then releases the trapped methane that's in gaseous form. So you get these uh, violent explosions, and so it goes right up through the water column, and it goes into the atmosphere from there. Now, what they're talking about here, it seems to me, is methane being re released in gaseous form. Now, in a hydrate, it's frozen in with the liquid, but it, the, the water will then uh, thaw slash melt, and therefore, the, you know, if you remove the pressure, then the methane can go into gaseous form. If the pressure is kept significantly high enough so that the methane stays in solution, then how, what happens to the methane depends on where it's at. If it's in the sediments, chances are that it will be subjected to uh, anaerobic bacteria. So the anaerobic bacteria using sulfate, what have you, will uh, result in the methane being oxidized down into carbon dioxide, which it's still in solution, may then uh, increase the pH, but may react with, let's say, calcium available to create calcium carbonate. If the methane is, active, is in solution in the water column, not the substrate, then you're going to most likely have aerobic bacteria acting on it, again, reducing it down into uh, CO2, uh, CO2, which then will react with the water to form carbonic acid that will then decrease the pH, increase the acidity. I'm giving very general uh, uh, re pathway reactions here, but you know, if the methane's in the, in the substrate, most likely anaerobic bacteria will act upon it, creating maybe calcium carbonate. In the water column, it will be aerobic. Then you're creating carbonic acid, maybe some uh, calcium carbonate. But in either case here, 
you're you're affecting the water chemistry. If it stays in gaseous form, it's going to make its way into the atmosphere. Now, not it depends on what's the limiting reagent, but some of the methane uh, that's in the water, that's dissolved in the water column, not all of it uh, will necessarily interact with or be acted upon by aerobic bacteria. It depends on you know the concentrations and that kind of stuff. Think of the what's the limiting reagent from your your basic uh, you know, chemistry uh, classes. So in that case, it may the methane may still diffuse through the, upward through the water column and may still diffuse into the atmosphere versus just you know in gaseous form blowing through the water column or right straight into the atmosphere. So. What they're basically talking about is, you know, we need to better understand how much is there and what's going to affect its release. That's what they're saying. It's being released from the sediment. We have a cap over it. If, if you melt that cap, it's, there's nothing holding it back. And that's what I discussed basically in that WAPTEV uh, uh, shelf uh, video. However, you might find in the unfrozen upper sediment layer, it's, it's still cool, it's cold enough, maybe a little above the freezing point, so now this methane there can be released. So, they're basically outlining, uh, uh, outlining uh, for us uh, where some of, the, uh, what, some of the knowledge gaps that need to be filled in, some of the findings there, some of the implication, some of the processes that is happening. I just tried to summarize for you, uh, you know, s s what can happen to the methane in the sediments in the water column or just in blowing through in the gaseous form, what have you. But there is a load of methane in, in the shelf. And with the, you know, they're talking about, you know, tectonic activity. Okay, fine. Seismic activity, okay, fine, but you're having warm oceanic temperatures being brought in. That is melting the protective caps, if you will, that is helping to thaw out the permafrost. So you, you're melting the protective icy caps that has the methane trap, it gets relieved. You thaw out the, the substrate where the methane is in, you know, found, that gets released. Just like thawing out the, the permafrost in atmospheric conditions that helps release methane, the warmer oceanic waters or seismic tectonic activity will also increase more methane being released. Bottom line is more methane will get released. How much, how fast, you know, research will, uh, will uh, reveal that information in due time. But it is generally accepted that there is a load of methane. And if it gets released quickly, that's going to spell problems. If it gets released slowly, it's still going to spell problems just over a longer time span. And then don't forget, once in the atmosphere, it gets oxidized down into CO2. So methane affects will be felt for decades. So I just wanted to share this with you. You know, they mentioned the LabTev. Yeah, that's a site of a lot of uh, uh, research activity, as I described to you before in that video. So hopefully they'll be able to start quantifying better. There is some initial quantification. Hopefully they'll be able to provide more quantifications to give us an idea of the flux, you know, of methane to the atmosphere, and that from and from there we can, of course, um, make projections on the warming effects and what that will do to to uh, temperatures and the climate for planet in general. Thank you for your time. Hello, folks. This is Jim here with Science Talk, asking you to please subscribe to my channel and to inform others of my channel and of the work that I do. Please share to social media platforms that you use. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I load up more videos. 
Finally, I ask that you support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your support.